All right, so I apologize. We're doing something just a little bit different today. I just really want to get us through this. And right now, my car's not working, so I can't drive there. It's a long story. But anyway, let's just keep on going. All right, so for this particular uh, class, we're going to cover some jazz poetry, and we're going to be covering haikus, and we're going to just dive right into it. If you have a chance before, you can pause this and get back into Canvas. I want you to get the jazz poem. I'm gonna send you a link in there. There's always a way for you to, you know, as an attachment, you can get to it. So get that first, you can pause me, and then go get it. Um, and then, sorry, my cat's eating my lunch. God damn it, cat. Y'all, I'm falling apart. <laughs> I'm just gonna, I'm not editing this. We're just gonna keep going. Okay, so for the jazz poem, I want you to take a look at um, line breaks and how this particular author, who is uh, Langston Hughes, um, the moves that he makes as he is going through these line breaks and also look at full end rhymes. Do we see them? Do we not? Is there a reason why they work if they're there or does it work if they're not? All right. So what I'll have uh, some, I'm going to have, um, uh, let's see. I don't know who actually, I don't know who actually said, I don't know if it's Langston Hughes who's reading their own poem, but I'm going to have someone else read it. So that way you can see how it is supposed to be read because that's the intent of what I'm going to show you. Next, after that, we're going to go into another poem with line breaks. Um, we're going to talk about bread on page 22, and then uh, maybe green chilies if we can get to it, and then we're going to cover a couple haikus, okay? All right, so let's get to it. First and foremost, we're going to start with the jazz poem, if you can get that ready. All right, I don't know how you want to do it on your phone or something, maybe have this in the background, uh, and we can go from there. All right, so let's go. Jukebox Love Song I could take the Harlem night and wrap it around you. Take the neon lights and make a crown. Take the Lenox Avenue buses, taxis, subways, and for your love song, tone their rumble down. Take Harlem's heartbeat, make a drum beat, put it on a record, let it whirl. And while we listen to it play, Dance with you till day. Dance with you, my sweet brown Harlem girl. All right. So we got a little bit going on there. Um, lots of rhythm. If you were following along while it was being read, you might have noticed a very strong pause um, at tone, right? There's a couple strong pauses where the intent was to slow you down just a little bit, right? Even though, and uh, that was also a very long line too, right? Um, notice at the end we have heartbeat, drum beat, world play, day, girl. World, girl, day, play, right? Those are the only full end rhymes that we have, but what it does is it almost ties it all together and kind of gives it a very specific beat as it gets to the end, okay? All right, cool. Um, that was kind of my whole goal there. Please feel free to pause, go back, read that again. Um, what we would have normally done in class is kind of worked with this a little bit more, um, but we just don't have the abilities right now. So you're free to do that as you wish. Um, you'll notice if you scroll down, there's a little bit more, um, to creating image, um, what we call an image party where we all collaborate and create a poem. Um, so that would have been kind of fun to do, but this is what it is. We're going to move forward. Okay. Uh, let's go to page 22. We're actually going to read bread. And we're going to talk about the odd line breaks because, um, as Justin had said before, how do you do line breaks? And sometimes, you know, you got to kind of follow either what the poem wants you to do um, <clears throat> or what you need it to do, if that makes any sense. So we're going to be reading re uh, sorry, Bread by Sharon Olds. Bread. When my daughter makes bread, a cloud of flour hangs in the air like pollen. She sifts and sifts again, and the salt and sugar, close as the grain of her skin. She heats the water to body temperature, with the sausage lard fragment as her scalp, and the day before hair wash, and works them together on a flowered board. Her broad palms bend and pace towards her, and the heel of her hands presses it away, until the dough begins to snap, glossy and elastic, as the torso bending over it. This 10-year-old girl, random specks yeast in her flesh beginning to heat, her volume doubling every month now, but still raw and hard. She slaps the dough and it crackles under her palm, sleek and ferocious and still leashed 
like her body, no breasts rising like bubbles of air toward the surface of the loaf. She greases the pan she is shaped, glazed, and at any moment goes into the oven to turn into that porous, warm substance and then under the knife to be sliced for having the tasting and the giving of life. Take a minute and please look not only at those line breaks, look at the imagery and what is this poem saying? I will give you a second to pause me, think about it, and see if you got what I got out of it. Pause. Okay, you probably didn't pause, but whatever. All right. Okay, so I'm imagining you know exactly what this is saying and how do we know what are some of the words that are used in here to give it away? Okay, I'm going to help you out with that. So let's kind of think about what does dough do when it's been seeded with yeast, right? What does it do? It starts to expand, right? It starts to get bigger. Well, if you're a 10 year old girl, man, that's a really young age when you think about this. Anyway, <laughs> when you really, she's going through, she's kneading and then she's expanding, right? She's growing. She has been seeded. She's pregnant. Okay, so that's what we're going for here. Um, so the, the part here is they're talking about how the daughter in making bread is also making life, right? So um, obviously this poem's a lot older um, in a time where usually women were having kids really, really young. So we have to kind of look at, at it like that. Um, we can also look at yeast in her flesh beginning to heat her volume doubling every month now. Okay, but still raw and hard. Okay, so that's, these are the, the givens of how we can read pregnancy into this. So um, the other thing to kind of take a look at is those line breaks, those awesome line breaks where we have words like flour, sugar, temperature, scalp, palms, hand, dough, um, heat. Um, so you can see that where they're using those more image laden images, right? Those types of words it's creating more of an impact. Okay. So that's the thing that you want to look for in that particular one. So, okay. Um, what's the mom's attitude with the odd line breaks? What might you think is her attitude based on that? All right. Clouds of flour hangs in the air like pollen. She sifts and sifts again, the salt and sugar close as the grain of her skin. She heats the water, right? It kind of keeps going. It's like the mother kind of goes, right? <laughs> she recognizes what's going on and, you know, is, feels almost like back and forth. Like when they talk about the kneading of the bread, they kind of use that same imagery. It's just like, ah, it is being ingrained into the mother exactly what's going on. Frank. Okay. All right, anyway, so we've got that. Um, take a look at that and feel free to find more things and bring it to class to me on Thursday. That would be awesome. Um, I always like your reads on, um, on this work. All right, Green Chilies, page 20. How does this poem work? How do you get the meaning? What are some word uh, line breaks? And then what gets the most attention within this poem? Green Chili by Jimmy Santiago Baca. I prefer red chili over my eggs and potatoes for breakfast. Red chili ristras decorate my door, dry on my roof and hang from eaves. They lend open air vegetable strands, historical, granula, granular, and gently swing with an air of festive welcome. I can hear them talking in the wind, haggard, yellowing, crisp, rasping tongues of old men licking the breeze. But grandmother loves green chili. When I visit her, she holds the green chili pepper in her wrinkled hands. Ah, voluptuous, masculine, an air of authority and youth simmers from its swan neck stem, tapering to a flowery collar, fermenting re reasonous spice. A well-dressed gentleman on the door my grandmother takes sensuously in her hand, rubbing its firm, glossed sides, caressing the oily, rubbery serpent with mouth-watering fulfillment fondling its curves with gentle fingers, its bearing magnificent and taut as flanks of a tiger in mid-step. 
She thrusts her blade into the cu and cuts it open with lust on her hot mouth, sweating over the stove, bandana around her forehead, mysterious passion on her face as she serves me green chili con carne between soft, warm leaves of corn tortillas with beans and rice, her sacrifice to her little prince. I slurp from my plate with the last bit of tortilla and my mouth burns and I hiss and drink a tall glass of water. All over New Mexico, sunburned men and women drive rickety trucks stuffed with gunny sacks of green chili from Belen Veru I can't read that. Veguta, Willard, Estancia, San Antonio, and Sakarov. From fields to roadside stands, you see them roasting green chili in green-sided homemade barrels for a dollar a bag. We relive this old, beautiful ritual again and again. All right, so take a quick minute and look at that and notice the stanzas. Notice what's happening in each stanza and tell me what you think is coming from that, okay? You can pause me and I'm back, okay. All right, so when you look at each of these stanzas, what do you see that stands out to you most? Most specifically, I would say that third stanza, which it's, it's broken up into two, but I'm gonna say that's one full stanza, especially based on the way we have a comma and a lowercase at the beginning of this top part up here. Notice the sensuality, right, of that second stanza, the very long, you know, stanza. Um, the intent there, I think, is to show when we talk about sensuality and sensory with food, that right there is that intent. That's what they do there. Um, the strong word line breaks is what we look, are looking for. Similar into the last poem, we look at Hands, masculine, simmers, flowery, spice, door, hand, side, serpent, fulfillment, fingers, top, leap, thus, uh, lust, stove, forehead, face, conone, tortillas, sacrifice, prince, plate, burns, water. Whew. Every single one of those lines is just good, right? Uh, my favorite line, ah, voluptuous, masculine, an air of authority, and youth simmers. Has any of you ever had green chilies before? Um, if you've ever had green chilies, the description here is how you're preparing them, um, but they make it a very lustful, uh, kind of like a love affair, right, between grandma and the chilies. It's not terrible. I think they do a really good job with it, actually. Might kind of come off a little bit weird, but I think they do a great job. Um, we talk about uh, sound similarities we have with beans and rice for sacrifice. Notice that's one line two sound similarities, and it creates a rhythm and a beat. Right? All right. Cool. Um, so what gets the most attention? I think the second stanza gets the most attention here. The line breaks get the most attention. Um, the green chili gets the most attention, too, when we talk about that, um, even though the speaker prefers red chilies, right? Um, and how red chilies decorate their house. They're everywhere for this particular speaker, but in Grandma's house. It's all about the green chilies. So, all right, a little bit of an amb ambivalence there, maybe? Question mark? Okay, um, so take a look at this. See how what kind of meaning you're getting from it. Um, again, come to class with a little bit more of an idea on it. We can come back to this and make it a little bit more fun. All right, so let's go to haikus on page five. I don't know how much time I wanted to spend on this, but I think it's important, especially as we're doing revisions in poems, um, to get really good at being more succinct, being more get to the point, say the thing. The problem is sometimes with poems, I'm sorry, poems, with haikus, they're a little murkier, right? And they don't really tell the whole story as you would with a little bit longer of a poem. But there's art to that too, right? And that's kind of the intent. So. Um, with haikus, we have five, seven, five. I don't know if you can remember that when we do, um, I'll, I'll, I'll read the poem first. I'll read uh, After Spring first, and then I'll go over all the little beats to kind of help you out. Um, this might be something to consider, you know, as you're working through your poems, does it matter your syllabus, your, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, syllables, right? When you're counting your syllables, will that matter? Like, you know, when we're talking about line breaks, does it matter how we end these these line breaks based on the syllable count maybe that matters to you um and maybe you can read it in a way where you can do that and it can still be subtle that not everyone's reading it as you might a haiku okay all right 
After Spring by Cora. After spring sunset, mist rises from the river, spreading like a flood. All right. So after spring sunset, mist rises from the river. Seven. Okay. Spreading like a flood. Okay. All right. So that's going to be our first haiku. Um, we're going to compare that now to the other, uh, th well, we have three haikus and these three haikus were set up um, very specifically, it actually went one through 10, but they chose these particular um, haikus from just a list of the 10 that they had, but it'll be haikus from Etheridge Knight. Okay. So the first haiku, Eastern Guard Tower, glints in the sunset, convicts rest like lizards on rocks. Four, to write a blues song, is to regiment riots and pluck gems from graves. All right. Five. A bare pecan tree slips a pencil shadow down a moonlit snow slope. I like that one. That's my, my, that my, might be my favorite. <laughs> All right. So again, Eastern Guard Tower glints in sunset, convicts rest like lizards on rocks. Okay. To write a blue song is to regiment riots and pluck gems from graves. By the way, I don't know if you noticed like I did, gems from graves, we got the G's in the beginning, right? It kind of, gems from graves. Hmm. Cause you could say jewelry, right? And, you know, but then you're, 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 notice the importance of using the word gem versus jewelry, jewelry, right? You've got more syllables versus gem. Gem from graves. Okay, so you create a beat. And we still get the same idea. We know exactly what they're saying. You're, you know, robbing from graves is pretty much the, the line there. Okay. Um, a bear pecan tree slips a pencil shadow down a moonlit snow slope. All right. I love that one because you could just see that, like, that very bear, that bear naked, um, bear naked ladies, <laughs> bear naked pecan tree and how it has a very thin shadow, a pencil thin shadow on a snowy bank right? Like it only took three lines and five to seven syllables in order to make that very beautiful image. Okay. When we talk about four, to write a blues song is a regiment riots, is to regiment riots and pluck gems from graves, right? That's when we're comparing what it's like to write a blues song to regiment riots, to create riots and pluck gems from graves, like the power behind music, right? It's most specifically blues, Okay, and then we have Eastern Guard Tower glints in sunset, Conv convicts rest like lizards on rocks, right? So you can look over at this guard tower, right? So it's a prison, um, the way it gleams in the sunset. So we're creating this really beautiful image and then the convicts are resting like lizards on rocks, right? So much said and so little. I think that's why I love some of these poems is because the power in which you can create something, which is a little ton of bits. Okay. All right. Um, so again, haikus encourage the idea of consciousness and imagery. The importance is it's not saying everything outright. It's a little muddy. It's a little, you know, maybe a little bit murky, but at the same time, you can read it very well and go, I know exactly what you're saying. Um, for after spring, after spring sunset, mist rises from the river spreading like a flood, right? That mist is doing this. All right. You can just really envision what it looks like um, as the sun is setting, okay? Mist rises. So when we think of setting, we think of death, we think of rising, we think of life, right? So we've got a couple different ways, or I guess spring is renewal, sunset would be, you know, I don't know if death is right, but, you know, going back into sleep kind of thing, all right? And then mist rising over the river, we have a river and flood. Again, we have very similar um, image clusters going on, but meaning kind of different things, so... Ta-da! All right, so um, flood could also mean something like maybe it's overwhelming. Is that good? Is that bad? That overwhelming mist, the spring is coming. Um, I think that is left for the reader to interpret for themselves. I think that's the intent there. All right, all right, all right. Um, what I normally would have done in class is to have you um, choose an image from your other poems, maybe something, just one thing, and write around that. Again, you'd want a five, seven, five. I'd love it. 
if you could take some practice for yourself, since we're not in class right now, um, to try and figure out how can you practice 575 with one type of image or uh, idea, right? Um, very similar to how we had the Eastern Guard Tower glints in the sunset, convicts resting like lizards on rocks. I didn't read that like a haiku, I apologize. Um, the idea there is something incredibly simple but very powerful using nothing but images. Like we already understand the ambivalence, right, of this beautiful sunset, and yet we have lizards and we have convicts and we have, you know, this guard tower, right? So it's it's kind of a, a lot of ambivalence. And I believe Stephanie had asked, well, can ambivalence be more than just love and hate? Absolutely. It can be image ambivalence too, right? Um, beautiful sunset, a glist, glistening sunset, and then we have lizards and convicts, right? So we can definitely have the, the combination of that. Same thing with gems and graves, right? Those are very conflicting. Uh, and it also tells a story of a grave robber, okay? Um, and then again, the bear pecan tree, you can already see the color of that in contrast to the idea of the line of a simple shadow, a pencil shaped shadow and a moonlit snow slope. All right, and again, snow slope. We've got those um, rhyming sound similarities, okay? All right, so uh, go ahead and give yourself some time to kind of work through some of these. Um, we are going to go over workshopping on Thursday. Um, and what we're gonna be doing, um, and I'll talk more about this in class, so for you, um, we will go in class and we will be workshopping as a whole somebody's poems, right? We're gonna do a couple different poems and we're gonna be workshopping those as a group. And then when you get into your group, you're gonna pick four of your five poems, four of your five, you're gonna have these printed for everybody. So if you've got two people in your group, you're gonna have two copies of each poem, right? So uh, this poem will have two copies, this poem will have two copies, this will, and this will. So technically you're going to have eight <laughs> pieces of paper you're gonna be handing out. So everyone should get one copy of each of your poems, each of your four poems. And the reason why we do this is we're gonna go through each poem of yours. We do that same thing where we read it out loud. We give everyone a second to reread it. Somebody will say what that poem they think is, you know, what it's about. And then you will all go through and see, hey, what's working here? This is a great move. What could maybe be done to help make a, another move even better? Okay, that's going to be our ultimate goal there. So keep that in mind. Uh, we will doing definitely more workshop officially on Thursday because my car is going to be done. That's what I'm saying. It's going to be because we need to. Um, Y'all are fantastic. I have no qualms or worries about um, where we're going to be next. Uh, but if you would like to also go, um, so in English 6, week 6 is where we have um, all the jazz poem stuff. Um, I don't think I have a week 7. Oh, I did have a week 7. Let's see what we got. Oh, we're just going through the jazz poems. Yeah, we pretty much did everything. So <laughs> the PowerPoint's a little bit off by a week, but it's it perfectly on time with what we need. So go ahead and take a look at that. If you have questions, please message me. Practice some haikus, like bring some to class and tell me what you find out. Uh, when you go through the green chilies or even the bread, maybe you have a different take on the bread one. I would love to hear where you come from on that one. Let me know what the images are. It's hard because I'm so used to class. Now I'm trying to step back and reviewing these poems because I don't want to give too much away because I feel like you would have found this on your own. So. Hopefully you're already doing that, um, but go through and reread bread for me and tell me what you come up with. Uh, and maybe bring a couple haikus to class. I'd love to see what you come up with. Um, and then we'll have some discussion on it. We'll do some workshops. So I'm so sorry we didn't have class today. I'm really bummed, but I just wanted to give you this so that at least you have something to work with. And I will see you all on Thursday. Thank you.